When I get home from a day shopping in a city street I pop on the kettle though I'm nearly dropping on my feet Make a nice cup of tea then I switch on my favourite channel It's the best time for me as I flick off my flyaway panel When we've been out for a treat at a flesh and blood theatre If you call it a treat peering up and down the street for a metre I think of old songs and the memories they bring back While my thoughtful norm helps me off with my left and right sling back And I think of old songs from old shows As I blow down my nose And I think of a dear old hymn The time will never dim for me Before I met my norm It was the only hymn for me All things bright and beautiful All creatures great and small All things wise and wonderful Australia has them all Our famous ballerinas Joan Sutherland, their star Cadbury's chocolate bar A cloth all personal snowy For austral picnic spread Where hums the humble blowy And beetroot stains the bread All things bright and beautiful Have loathers that we bake All things white Australia takes the cake Our great big smiling beaches The smell of thick quick tan Our lovely juicy peaches That never blow the can Our gorgeous modern cities So famed throughout the earth Street, the Melbourne end of Perth. All things bright and beautiful, though cynic, sneer and plot. All things wise and wonderful, Australia's got the lot. The pharynx that we scrape off of those we Australian chin. The fennel that we sprinkle Inside our rubbish bins Our plate glass picture windows Venetians open wide In the land where nothing happens There's nothing much to hide All things bright and beautiful Wealth of natural mineral resources All things wise and wonderful And our even more wonderful wealth of different brands of tomato sauces Australia is a Saturday With races on the tranny Australia is the talky smell Of someone else's granny Australia is
Hello, Adulin here, and welcome to the other side of... I was going to say my auntie, but it's my adopted auntie. And it's Dame Edna Everidge. Hello, Possums, and Ed Doolan. Give us a hug. Mm. 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 I haven't seen oh, you for so lovely. long. You still are wearing that aftershave, aren't you? Is it Brute or Paco Rabanne? I, I can't place it, but it's something in between. <laughs> Ed, you're looking lovely, and you are really just like a nephew to me. He is listeners. He's a... Adorable. We've known each other. Ed Doolan, how far back do we go? Well, I can remember going to your shows at the Phillips Street Theatre in Sydney in 1964-65. Good heavens, I'm older than most of your listeners. <laughs> and then, of course, we first met when you were doing uh, uh, Treasure Island. Or at least wasn't you. You weren't doing it. Well, but, I uh... wasn't. I came to the show once. I think it was my manager, Barry Humphreys, in a pathetic attempt to build a theatrical career for himself. With Spike Milligan, then? He was playing Long John Silver on one leg. And um, he was quite good. But uh, later on, he became my manager. And it all went very well until the embezzlement. It always happens. Behind every megastar, there's a very sad story of theft, unfortunately. And has he been picking your pocket? It doesn't worry me, Ed, because I do this for love. I think the people of Birmingham feel that. So many stars come here. We won't name names except to say that that's that and various groups. They come here to take. I come to give. That's the difference. I'm a giver. And uh, so I do it for love. I love what I do. To bring joy to people at, at this time, particularly in history, when there's so much sadness, Ed, isn't there? So much sadness and gloom. But um, I like to be back in Birmingham. The bull ring's gone. Yes, it has. We have a shopping centre there now. Oh, but yes. it is called the Bullring Shopping Centre. Oh, it, it, it's been commemorated. How you ever let that happen to your city, goodness only knows. But I think after the war... There may have been German agents who worked still for the Luftwaffe. They were the people who bombed, weren't they? <laughs> and, and they had instructions to continue the work of Goering after the war. In Birmingham. By demolishing some of our beautiful cities, <laughs> even after the bombing had stopped. <laughs> You're in, of course, another uh, another new edition from your last visit. Uh, all our other interviews have been done at Pebble Mill, but we're now in the centre of town at the and mailbox. Pebble Mill, I loved. What happened to it? It's been totally bulldozed to the ground. Pebble Mill had a lovely romance about it, and the idea of viewers, and I say viewers because a lot of people, particularly elderly people, look at the radio... They're unwise to do so, but they do, in the hope that something's going to pop out of their little Bakelite grill. <laughs> it never does. <laughs> but um, Pebble Mill was a radio and TV station. I'm not sure it was built as that, but it had a big foyer, and it struck someone as a good idea to use that as the venue for a television, a lunchtime television show, and it was very popular, wasn't it, Ed? Pebble Mill at one. Who were who the couple who were mostly identified with that show? And Diamond and Nick Owen. Oh, Nick! He's changed, hasn't he? <laughs> Time hasn't been good to him. Dame Edna, can I take you back to those very early days and to the first time I saw you perform? Uh, in fact, at that time, you were doing about eight different characters. There was yourself, of course, but there were other characters as well, including, uh, I think one of my favourites was a surfy. Can you tell our listeners what a surfy is? Well, a surfy, and don't think this was me. This was one of the other actors, could have even been Barry Humphreys, attempting once again, rather pathetically, to carve a reputation for himself. People addicted to going to the beach and surfing in Australia are called surfies. And they are, generally speaking, a lot of drunks. It's, it's dreadful to say that, but they drink too much, and very often they have bilious attacks. They are sick. 
into the beautiful waters of the Pacific. Barry Humphreys thought that this unsavoury topic was suitable for a song, and he, he wrote it and sang it, and it became almost a national anthem in Australia. In fact, there was talk about turning it into the Australian national anthem. What a horrible idea that was. So this is one of the rare occasions in this country that uh, Barry Humphreys has ever actually been heard. Ever been heard on radio, and I hope it's the last time. Oh, I was down by Manly Pier, drinking tubes of ice cold beer with a bucket full of prawns upon me knee. But when I swallowed the last prawn, I had a technicolor yawn. And I chummed it in the old Pacific Sea. Drink it up, drink it up. Crack another dozen tubes and prawns with me. If you want to throw your voice, mate, you won't have any choice but to chunder in the old Pacific Sea. I was sitting in the surf when a mate of mine called Murph asked if he could crack a tube or two with me. The bastard barely swallowed it when he went for the big spit. And he's hunted in the old Pacific Sea. Oh, drink it up, drink it up. Crack another dozen tubes and prawns with me. If you want to throw your voice, mate, you won't have any choice but to chunder in the old Pacific Sea. I've had liquid laughs in bars. And I've hurled from moving cars. And I've chuckled when and where it suited me. But if I could choose a spot to regurgitate me lot, then I'd chunder in the old Pacific Sea. Come on, drink it up, drink it up, juggle a juggle a crack, another dozen tubes and prawns with me. If you wanna throw your voice, mate, you won't have any choice but to chunder. In the old Pacific Sea. Excuse me. <laughs> that must have been what oh, forty horrible. odd years ago. Heavens! It's almost before I was born, Ed. And you were born in? Uh, well, actually, I was born in the country, in a place called Wagga Wagga, which is an Aboriginal word meaning a meeting of the waters. All Aboriginal words mean that. <laughs> and um, then, when I was quite young, my family moved to Mooney Ponds, Melbourne, a lovely suburb. Mooney Ponds, Melbourne. It wasn't exactly a solihull, but it was very refined and nice. You were telling us something just before we came on the air with Professor Carl Chin. You were telling us... Uh uh, some uh, background about that particular name. Yes, well, Mooney Ponds is a double name. It's part Aborigine, the word Mooney, and Ponds means little lakes. And there are a series of lakes on the river there at Maribyrnong River. And, of course, they don't flood or anything, but we had a... It's a low-lying area. And the homes are mostly Victorian or Edwardian houses. And... Um, I am very proud to say now that a street in that suburb has been named after me. A whole cultural centre, the Edinburgh Ed Ed Average um, Cultural Centre in Mooney Ponds. And also, and this is the most proud achievement of my life, the Norman Everidge Prostate Foundation. Really in memory of my husband's rogue organ. And the Prostate Foundation is there to spread information about the prostate because it is amazing how few people know about this. I'm sure that a lot of people listening have heard the word but wouldn't be able to put their finger on it. You're, uh, without, you're, uh, without, without, <laughs> with any degree of ease. <laughs> your, your, your dear husband has passed on now. Norm has. I lost him quite a long time ago. He was older than me, listeners. He was much older than he told me. I, even when we signed the register at the church after we were married, 
It was then I saw his correct age. He'd been telling me fibs. He was quite a bit older. And he had plumbing problems on our honeymoon. I remember he was up and down all night. And um, I said to a girlfriend of mine, I said, she said, how was your honeymoon? I said, well, he was up and down all night. And she said, well, that's quite normal. I said, no, no not really. I mean, he, when he got out of bed, he didn't put the bedclothes back. It was quite drafty. And then the sound of the flushing and all that type of thing. And it was to do with little, some little plumbing problems that Norm himself had. I didn't understand it. What young woman of my generation was brought up to understand that type now, of thing? Damon, I don't want to distress you, but our listeners may be interested in the manner of his passing. It, uh, it, 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 it was a very sad tale, but it's a tale that only you could tell. Well, uh, the time passed, and Norm, unfortunately, he had developed a, a murmur. It was a prostate murmur. It was actually quite audible. It got louder. Neighbours complained. There's hammering on the front door. People saying, horrible people. Would your husband keep his prostate down? That type of thing. What could I say? I said, there's no volume control on it. We had machine. There was a new technology developed. Um, a big, quite a, a lot of machinery, which did the work of the prostate. He was hooked up to it. We had to buy the house next door to accommodate this um, artificial prostate, as it were. I mean, it's been miniaturized and microchipped since then. But this is in early days. We're going back to the 70s. So my husband lingered on in the clinic, which I had pretty well paid for, uh, and he was doing quite well. And um, one day I went in there and he was gone. He was gone. I mean, one minute alive, more or less, and the next minute gone. And we tried to understand what had happened, and I'll tell you what had happened. A Czechoslovakian woman, cleaner, had come in to Hoover, the hospital. She'd gone into Norm's facility, she'd pu pulled out his support system and plugged in the Hoover. She'd cut him off. I mean, isn't it dreadful? However, of course, the hospital was spotless after that. <laughs> spotless. So he, he, he left us in a clean room. That's, it was a that's, clean that's break, nice. that's I always nice. said. <laughs> now, Dame Edna, when you were Mrs. Edna Everidge and uh, we saw you working in Australia, you were quite, if I can, I don't want to be rude, but... You were quite a dowdy lady I in those dowdy. days. I was dowdy. No, you... Glamour had not reached you. Please, Ed Doolan, our relationship is based on honesty. I was a very... A, I was almost a frump. Highly intelligent, acutely aware, observant, but a frump. Clothes didn't mean anything to me because I came from a generation which had very little after the war. You know, we were scrimping and saving. And um, I discovered glamour, or glamour discovered me, much later. I, in the 50s, the, my favourite colour was maroon. Or as we call it in Australia, maroon. I've never been sure why we call maroon maroon, but we did. Uh, the other colour was duck egg blue, I was fond of, and aqua. N and sometimes a, a colour, a sort of caramel colour. But um, I never wore anything else. And I always wore a hat. My hair, I dyed. I was born with beautiful mauve hair. And I was always ashamed of it. I was teased at school. Children can be so cruel. They teased me at school. They called me Mauve Mop. And I dyed it brown. I bought some cheap dye. And I have only let my hair natural colouring grow out in the last 30 years. And it is my natural colouring. And it's rare. And it's in the Guinness, Guinness Book of Records. But I slowly became more sophisticated. I knew I had it in me, Ed. 
You see, when I won the lovely mother contest, uh, and it was an Australia-wide competition, I was able to go to England. The, the prize was a trip and one show. So I went to England with a girlfriend. Norm was already not well enough to travel. And I saw my fair lady. Now, it could be that our listeners are too young to know that show, but it is about a little flower girl who turns into a duchess merely by, well, changing her voice and dressing nicely. And that kind of happened to me when I saw Julie Andrews on stage with Rex Harrison. Oh, that dates me, doesn't it? I am... Um, I thought, I'm that person. And I came back to Australia, determined to improve myself, and I, ma I had two, three young children, an invalid husband, a dysfunctional bridesmaid, Madge, who lived with us, and my mother, who was already destined for a home for the bewildered. And I thought, what am I going to do? And I made a big decision. And it was the most important decision of my life. I put my family last. I'd recommend, listeners, you do the same. Put them last. If you put them first, they'll never thank you. There will not be a word of thanks to you. Put them last and get on with your lives. Your daughter that we've seen on television recently mm. doesn't appear to show you the sort of respect I would expect to she be given to a, to, a, no. to, a lover, to a loving mother. I don't blame myself for that. For many years I did. Every time the police called me up and I had to bail her out of this and bail her out of that, I knew I was doing the wrong thing. I should have let her reach her rock bottom. But that's a hard thing for a mother, Ed. A very hard thing. And Val May has become, well, she, I've done, I even put her on television. I thought I'll help her. I didn't. I got so many letters of complaint. She depressed people, the sight of her. She's, I mean, she's a compulsive shoplifter. And her friends, a most peculiar set of friends she has. None of the married women. When did you, or when were you elevated from Mrs. Everidge to Dame? Edna it happened Everidge? in the 70s. It was, it was extraordinary. Ed. I'm talking, I'm doing all the talking. It, um, it happened in the 1970s when the Prime Minister of Australia, Gough Whitlam, made me a dame in honour of my services to Australian culture. And the Queen has ratified that. And the Queen is thrilled that I'm a dame, and we're very, very close, the Queen and me. She knows about this, does she? Not what she knows about it. We see. I stay there when I'm in London. I've got my. You, own, you stay at the palace. I stay at the palace. I have my own key, my own shelf in the fridge. A cheering crowd at my stage door. An audience crying out for more. That's what my public means to me The loyal fans who queue for hours The cards, the telegrams and all those lovely... <laughs> Butterfingers, all those lovely, lovely flowers Yes, possum, that's what my public means to me you need to have a pretty humble attitude When you see little faces looking up Grotesque <laughs> With gratitude But from tiny tots to grannies I love all your nooks and crannies And that's what my public means to me The Queen's birthday honours list This lovely Cartier on my wrist what my public means to me A limousine, a sable coat The lump that's rising in my throat That's what my public means to me Superstars may come and go But there's no other That folks identify with their own mother To think there's people in this room Who wish they'd sprung out of my That's not a word you 
often hear in a song, is it, darling? <laughs> and that's what my public means to me. The royal visitors who call a concert in the Alfred Hall. That's all what my public means to me. All those requests I get to stay with famous folk in San Tropez. And that's their idea of fun for me. But you can keep Roman Polanski and Bianca. It's for the company of nobodies like you, I hang. You're my shelter from the storm. You're as precious as my norm. That's what my public means to me. Dame Edna, um, a piece of music that's become your theme song, really, is a piece called Niceness. Where did niceness come from? Niceness is really the Australian quality. Niceness is something my mother insisted upon. By the way, there's something that we used to know about that I don't think anyone discusses. Poise. There was a time when young women sought to have something called poise. There were schools of poise. You could go along and learn to be poised. Can you imagine one of these young trollops that you see in the street today wanting to be poised? I, I, frankly, you can't. It's almost a foreign language, isn't it? The language of good taste and good manners as we were brought up to understand them. So I wrote a little song celebrating this very important characteristic. Many people ask me my secret of success. Is it in the way I speak? Or the lovely way I dress? Is it poise or personality? What elusive little facet! Let me help you put your finger on my single greatest asset. It's my niceness. I pride myself on my niceness. It's such a gift without price to be nice even when you feel blue. Cause I really care and I've come here to share my wonderful, wonderful with you oh. What is it that makes us different From the creatures in the zoo It is a brain of beauty Animals have got those too It cannot be intelligence Just look at all those rats and mice Ooh. But Dame Nature has blessed us alone With a gift of being nice Niceness raises all of us above the common herd. So join me in this hymn of praise to my favourite four-letter word. She's got niceness, and now prides herself on her niceness. She's got a gift without price, and she's nice when other folks make a fuss, because she really does care. Free, so it's a mystery why there's not a lot more nice folks just like me. It's something we believe in when we go to church on Sunday. Niceness is a deodorant and a spotless pair of undies. You may have lost your money and led a life of price. You may be black or tinted and have naught to eat but rice. But if you clean your teeth three times a day, the chances are...
talking to Dame Edna Everidge, who joins Hello, us. Possums. I thought we were going to mm, continue. Oh, I'm down memory lane, Ed. Whenever I come to see Ed Doolan, we reminisce really compulsively, don't we? How did, uh, how did America happen? It happened in a remarkable way. And Ed's referring to this new career I have late in my life in the United States. I did a show in London about nine years ago that was, frankly, a mistake. It was too good for London. It was too elaborate. It was a musical based on my life and the lives of my ancestors. Perhaps it should have started in Australia. It had a lot of Australian elements, and it had a big cast. The trouble was the cast were too big, really, for the budget of the show. So we didn't run for very long, and some of the critics were very unkind. And I realised I'd reached what's called a watershed in my career. Which way was I to go? I called Joan Rivers, a friend of mine. I said, Joan, what am I going to do now? I feel I need a change. She said, come to America. We adore you. We've seen a lot of your TV shows on cable. Come to San Francisco because there's a group called the Village People who, if they're still alive, will flock to see you. So I did, and some of the village people were alive, and they came, and they brought their mummies and their aunties. But I did, I booked a theatre at my own expense for two weeks. I was still there four months later, <laughs> and I had a summons to New York. A producer put my show on on Broadway, and I, well... The rest is history. I got the Tony Award, I got the Critics Award, the Outer Critics Award, every kind of accolade I got. And I toured America after that, went to all the cities. Then I went back to Australia. I kept thinking, when am I coming back to England? They'll miss me. All these little places adore me. I don't change anything I do. I'm the same attractive, approachable woman. But they like me because, do you know, Ed, I'm honest. There's a thing called political correctness. And political correctness really means describing the world as it isn't. Not using your imagination or observation, telling, really telling lies about reality. And I don't hold with it. I speak my mind. And that shocks them, but it shocks them in a healthy way. They love me for my honesty. And I, they understand every word I say. I speak beautiful English. Many people think I'm Oxford educated. But um, I don't ask these questions. I just enjoy my success. And Americans are very nice people. I think... In a way, America is, well, it's an undiscovered country for us. We don't know enough about it. We watch movies, of course, which are full of people shooting each other and people saying horrible words, language, very ghastly language. But when you're there, it's not like that. They are fat, though there's a lot of obesity. I've never seen <laughs> fatter people, Ed. It's horrific. I mean, very few women can sit on a chair with both cheeks. <laughs> Isn't that a horrible isn't... thought? Very rarely. It's one cheek or the other. And they're used to it, the discomfort. They eat mostly rubbish. I mean, the Birmingham diet is healthy compared with the American diet. God. And they have no idea what coffee is. Everyone thinks Americans know how to make coffee. They make something that tastes like a chemical or ashes. Horrible. So I really, when I'm there, miss, I miss a lot of things about England because when I was a child in Australia, we called England home. We used to, you know, it was just called home because we all had grandparents who came from here. Right. 
and yeah. and you know yourself. Yeah, that's right. I mean, was it your grand great grandparents or your parents who were English? Uh, my great grandparents and grandparents were from this country. On my uh, on my mother's side, on my father's side, it was uh, oh, it goes back quite a few generations. Irish too, probably. With yes, a name like Doolan. I'd have thought so. Of course, that's the same with me, exactly the same. So it was home, and it felt like home. But America, in a way, is a second home to me. How does Australia uh, receive you now? Because you've, because uh, one of your friends, uh, well, I use the word friend, but one of your acquaintances, uh, Celeste Patterson, hmm. Can't have brought much joy to Australia. No, he was a very bad embarrassment. He was one of our major diplomats. But he wasn't diplomatic at all. His vulgarity and drunkenness brought Australia into terrible disrepute. He was a most unpleasant person. He's still around. And Barry Humphreys, when he puts on one of my shows, always insists that Les appears. I mean, he makes people physically sick, the sight of him. Quite honestly. But there's a link, really, between here and Australia. Did you know that in the Jurassic period, Birmingham was linked to Australia? <laughs> it was. <laughs> Tell me how. And they found in caves in Australia fossils of women, just like, well, those women in the other studio. Fossilised women. It's identical amazing. to Birmingham women. Just amazing. Just amazing. <laughs> we are in conversation with Dave Edna. Well, we're in monologue, really. I want to hear about <laughs> you, Ed Doolan. No, everybody knows about me. Well, everybody knows about you as well, I guess. They know too much already, and they're probably thinking, will that woman ever stop chatting? It's like the floodgates open, though, when I come to see Edward. I was going through some uh, recordings of yours. As you know, I have one or two at home. And I I've was got going through. Famous collection. <laughs> I was going through, and I found one about the night we burnt my mother's things. This was about my mother. Um, you know, my mother's still alive. It's amazing. And uh, I've. I've often been asked, why don't I start a cosmetic range? And um, I've thought about it, and I've done it at last. Do you remember when you were little and you tripped over and you grazed your knee? And your mother licked a hanky, didn't she? And patted it to make uh -huh. it better. That did make your knee better, and I often pondered on this. But I, a scientist did an analysis and there is an enzyme in the saliva of a good mother that has a healing property. And so I've begun what's called the mother's spit range. And my mother is in a facility now, but she does drool in commercially viable quantities. <laughs> and we are getting several barrels out of her a week. And I'm turning this into bath gel, into night cream, into beautiful beauty products. There's only a few drops needed of my mother's intensely powerful saliva. And the mother's spit range will soon be available in the beautiful mailbox arcade in some of the boutiques. So look out for it. My mother, unfortunately, has been in a home a long time. And when she left for the home, we did have to have a clean-out because, well, her room was a terrible disgrace. And I wrote a little song about it. Whatever may befall, no matter what the future brings, I don't think I'll forget the night we burnt my mother's things. Outside the night was chilly, but inside the fire shone bright. As my mother's long and frilly underwear was set alight My mother always lived with us We never had a boarder And you know she was something of a character And more than something of a hoarder She never let us in her room So we never really knew 
that it looked just like an Oxfam shop and smelt like Whipsnade Zoo. One night, Mummy was extra naughty. Simply everything was wet. <laughs> so reluctantly, I carried out an oft-repeated threat. A twilight home stood hard at hand. Oh, a hygienic, well-run spot. Where, unbeknownst to Mother, we'd long reserved her cot. A quick phone call and nice men were there to bundle her away. But when they got inside her bedroom, it seemed they didn't want to stay. They frog-marched Mother to their van as though their feet had wings, crying, we'll take your mum, but bugger us, you can keep her things. Wasn't that unnecessary? How uncalled for. In front of a senior citizen, too. I was disgusted. That evening was the first time that I'd stepped into her room. I felt like Lord Carnarvon, piercing Toot and Carmen's tomb. This is a family record. I can't say what I beheld. My knees, they shook my senses real. My gorge within me welled. It was time for instant action. I cried, gather round, my loves. I said, Kenny, fetch the paraffin. Snapping on my rubber gloves. Meanwhile, Brucey lined the family half with two layers. above your house a dirty great red glow why not bung them off to war on want or in the oxfam box i said what self-respecting refugee would wear my mother's frocks <laughs> the moral of the story isn't very hard to find it's often so essential to be cruel to be kind when your loved ones leave for twilight home it's no use to weep or moan. For if you laugh at others' troubles, it would help you be your own. Such warm compassion there, Diana. Yes. Well, I, I wish my mother could have laughed as we did on that occasion, but she's still surviving. She's wonderful. How was uh, changing subject completely? How was the last Parkinson show? It was, um, it was fun. It was nice to be asked by Michael. I was right at the end. And I wished, really, that he could have given me a nice interview. But he had Michael Caine, Billy Connolly, he had um, David Attenborough, good old favourites of the Parky Show, and James Judy Dench. 
dressed in her usual way, and um, I felt it needed colour and youth, <laughs> frankly. I brought that to the show, admittedly at the end, and uh, I was lovely on it. Most people have agreed that I was the best. But it was a sad moment because there's not so many interviewers in his class, are there? He's very distinctive looking, and I, th I think he's an awfully nice person. But you are the other interviewer that I like. You have got a lovely sensitivity about you. You wouldn't be in the business as long as you have, Ed, if you weren't a, a really good interviewer and a nice person. I'm, I'm on guard suddenly. No, Why am wouldn't. I on guard? I don't know. <laughs> Perhaps you're naturally a little bit tense. <laughs> Did you know, viewers, that Ed Doolan had a bit of a health problem fairly recently? But he's got through it, and that's a lovely thing. You must have been there in the hospital wondering a little bit about your life, looking back on things. <laughs> I know when I had my veins done. I've never had any cosmetic surgery. People wonder how I stay as young looking. They want to touch me in the street. Women come up and say, it is Edna, isn't it? I say, yes. They say, can I touch your skin? And I let them. I say, on condition that you... Stay away from my erogenous zones. Nobody's approached you in the street and, uh, asking to touch your erogenous zones, surely? Oh, no. But, of course, these silly women's magazines, which we began by discussing, seem to find new erogenous zones every day. <laughs> you would think we had them all over us. What is the future, Dame Edna? Television stage? What, what have you got in well, mind? Well, I've got this little mini-tour. I call a short tour a tourette. <laughs> And I'm having a little Tourette, and then I'm writing a new book, of a, a lot about my life since my autobiography was published. I'm writing to uh, um, quite a number of things, a new recipe book, for example, and I'm also planning my big new comeback in England. Because I think I've been away from the British public too long. I recently had a marvellous experience in Birmingham because I was the guest of Jasper Carrot, who I've known before he was a root vegetable. And he's a charming person, Jasper Carrot. And he does a Christmas show, and I was a guest on that, and I loved it. And I looked out in that huge, what's it called, that big centre that he does? The, 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 uh, the uh, NEC. Is. The NEC, oh, it's an unbelievable size. But people, and the warmth, the lovely-looking people. And I thought, and also nicely dressed, beautifully dressed, not horrible sweatsuits and trainers. People had gone to a bit of trouble, and I was on stage, and I'd gone to a bit of trouble, and it was just we bonded. It was beautiful. And I thought, why am I neglecting these marvellous, marvellous British audiences? Well, you actually haven't done a show here for a long time. One no. of the early ones in, ni in the early 1990s. Yes. Well, it's time my, mother, my mother was visiting from Australia. She was. I had her on stage. Her on stage. Bless her heart. And she's gone, of course. What about her things... <laughs> Did you dispose of them? I'm sure my sister went through them very carefully. <laughs> she did. <laughs> Ed, it's been so nice seeing you. As I've been talking to Ed Doolan, listeners, um, I felt a little moisture in my eyes. Um, just an emotion. It's when you're talking to a real person about real things and when you're discussing your favourite subject, in my case, me, and that I get a, a little bit teary, a little bit moved. And um, I hope it's going to be not too long before we have another chat, Ed. In fact, I hope we'll go on chatting for some years to come. It's been too long since I've been your guest. It's been far too long that I've been talking on this beautiful program and have given me such time is marvellous of you. And I want to wish everyone listening the most marvellous New Year. And remember, it's only going to be as good as you make it. Focus on your health and the health of your family. And also focus on that G word. Now, I've got quite a few G spots. Glamour is one. 
And another one is gratitude. Remember, none of us would be here. Forget what's happening in the world if we weren't a little bit grateful. A little bit grateful for the chances that we've been given, the opportunity to live in a country like England or Australia. And who knows about global warming? Frankly, we don't understand it. There's another G word, isn't it? Global warming. But be grateful, be healthy, and if you're a little bit depressed, and we all do get a bit depressed, the best cure is to do someone a good turn. I often say to people who come to me complaining of they're in the, been down in the dumps, I said, is there a hospital near you? Because if you ring them, you'll probably find there are some old people there who never get a visitor. How about just popping along, sitting by someone's bed for ten minutes, holding their hand, and uh, giving them a little bunch of flowers or something and going home? It means nothing to you, but what a lot it would mean to that person. So, please, remember what I say. I'm not just a silly old comedian. I'm a person. I'm, in fact, one of the nicest people you could ever wish to meet. Let us finish this chat, Dame Edna, <laughs> with uh, an extract from Last Night of the Poms, which you performed at the Royal Albert Hall. Carl Davis uh, remembers it with great affection. And I thought we might go out with your wonderful finale, Why Do I Love Australia? 1982 at the Royal Albert Hall. Why do I love Australia? Why does it grab me so? Life was so sunny and informal when my husband Norm was normal and my career was in embryo But the day came when I left Australia For Britain across the sea And though I'm now a household name I will never be the same Australia's cast its spell
It's the land of milk and honey. It's so rich and safe and funny. Thank you. 